since the aftermath of independence, Africa has been plagued by many problems of insecurity and instability. From interstate conflicts over border to interstate ethnic conflicts and terrorism, Africa faces serious security and peace challenges. Over the past 30 years, these conflicts have resulted in countless victims and caused much damage that partly justifies the backwardness of this continent. Even today, Africa is the scene of particularly deadly conflicts. Through the organization of um, African unity first, and then the African Union, Africa has demonstrating commitment and responsibility in the search of a solution to its problems of peace and security, immersed in an almost permanent cycle of violence. Africa has begun to develop indigenous solutions to respond sustainably. African solution to African problem proceed to this logic. The establishment of uh, a new peace and security architecture of the African Union contribute to this effort to Africanize stabilization and peacekeeping solution on the continent. And yet, despite the mechanism put in place, several internal conflicts, as Dr. Malakai clearly said, persist, including sociopolitical and humanitarian crisis and flagrant violation of human rights. As Africans, we remain in constructive self-criticism regarding the effectiveness of the mechanism put in place. But above all, we are confident in Africa's ability to be the solution of its own problems. The events on the way in Sudan and the chronic hotbeds of tension in the Great Lakes region, a region that I know very well, the Sahel and the Central Africa challenge us. Our stated ambition is to to change the paradigm, to shift the paradigm regarding the image of Africa. Very often, when we talk about Africa, the idea that is often referred to is that it's a continent of wars, continent of crisis, of political ethnic conflicts, population displacement, refugee camps, exile, humanitarian crisis. Many consider Africa to be a breeding ground for conflict and human suffering, a continent of misery and dependence. We want to shift this image. The recurrence of large-scale violence on this continent has contributed heavily to the economic backwardness of its young nations. Despite the efforts of the international community, conflicts persist and many hotbeds of tension are still per perceptible and Africa remains more than any other continent the most concerned by hotbeds of tension and various conflicts in the world. Allow me to continue in, in French. As, um, je voudrais dire... I would like to say, I will leave you the time to put on your headset so that we can continue in French and uh, the interpreters can change channel. We are aware of the potential that Africa has. We are aware of Africa's potential in terms of, in demographic terms. Africa is, has the highest, the strongest demographic growth um, by 2050. Yeah. 
one-third of the citizens of the world by 2050 will be African. We are aware of Africa's potential in terms of arable land. Some talk about 50%, some say 60%. But what is certain is that Africa has today more than half of arable land in the world. We are aware of Africa's potential in terms of energy resources. We know that in terms of these energy resources, Africa is a continent that counts in the world's future. We are aware of Africa's potential in environmental terms, the Congo Basin, uh, where my country lies and where most several uh, sub-Saharan countries border this area. And it is, and one of the pillars as far as being the lungs of the planet from an ecological standpoint. Africa has an important place in the world. Africa is the future of the world. But African youth, which has one of the highest growth rates in the world, can either be a spearhead for Africa and the world in general, or it can be an iron spear towards Africa, so a double-edged sword, essentially. And we are aware of this potential and moved by this potential. This is why we are determined to put forth Africa's assets. We know that without security, Africa cannot be a full-fledged actor in the world. Africa will then only become a stake for the world powers. I like the expression by Jacques Attali, a French philosopher, who likes to say that the international scene is a little bit like a hunt, where the various nations are either hunters or the hunted. And if Africa doesn't fix in a very clear manner its security issue, it will remain a continent where its people, its populations are continually in the position of being the hunted. Now, based on this perception, there was the passage from the Organization of African Unity towards the African Union. This is where Africa decided to redefine a new approach to this issue of pay and security on the continent. The entire peace and security apparatus of the African Union is based on APSA, the African Peace and Security Ac Architecture. This architecture brings together all the main African Union mechanisms to promote peace and security and stability in Africa. APSA, uh, which Dr. Malaike has talked about earlier, has five entities. First, the Peace and Security Council, the PSC, the Group of, Eld of the Wise, uh, the early warning, the continental early warning system, the Africa Stand by Force and the Fund for Peace. I am a lawyer by training, and I like to to kind of wink at, at the law. Article 2, paragraph 2 of the protocol of uh, of the PSC says that the Peace and Security Council must be supported by the Commission of the African Union Commission. And the um, Continental Early Warning System, the uh, Group of Elders, the African Standby Force, and the Peace Fund. The PSC works in collaboration with e the regional economic communities the the RECs. They work with regional mechanisms for the prevention, the management, and the settling of conflicts. The PSC also interacts with African representatives on the Security Council of the UN, which we call the A3. 
and other international organizations that are similar, or so, um, civil society organizations and other African organizations. Let me talk about the A3. I, I know what I'm talking about because I am as the representative of Gabon on the Security Council, I am one of the A3. We have three representatives, three states represented at the Security Council, Gabon, um, Ghana, and Mozambique. So um, Gabon and Ghana's mandates end at the end of December, and they will be replaced by Algeria and Sierra Leone. Now, in terms of the A3, so these three African representatives at the UN Security Council. It is following the 993rd session of the PSC on March 4th, 2021, that the uh, African Union's PSC adopted a decision on the role of the three um, elected African members on the Council of the General Council of the uh, on the, the UN because they articulate the voices of the continent so that it can express itself in a single voice uh, among international organizations, particularly in this case the Security Council of the UN. This is where a3 has a particularly essential role. It is one thing for the PSC to state the collective position of 55 African Union states, but it is an entirely different thing for this collective position to be broken down, to be amplified, and to find its the means of advocacy at the UN as uh, stipulated by Article 7 of the PSC, which assumes the main responsibility for maintaining um, international peace and security. It is through DA3 that the collective voice of Africa is heard within the Security Council, particularly in terms of the points that have been set up on the agenda that substantially are are talk about the main concerns on the continent. The decision of the Conference of African Heads of State that was adopted in January 2016 affirmed the specific responsibility of the A3 to ensure that the PSC decisions are properly reflected in the decisional process of the UN Security Council uh, regarding peace and security issues that have to do with Africa. Consequently, an important dimension of the role of DA3 is to take ownership, to articulate, and to firmly present the PSC's position within the UN's Security Council. However, the role of DA3 goes beyond presenting the common position of the African Union to the UN. The other dimension of the A3's role is its unique position to facilitate the pursuit of strategic partnerships between the PSC, the um, African Union Peace and Security Council, and the UN's Security Council in terms of maintaining peace and security in Africa. A reading of Article 17 of the PCS calls for a, a, a narrowing uh, of that the A3 must serve as a bridge between Addis Ababa and New York. And this is one of the mechanism of promotion and facilitation of the coherence of policies and coordination of these two important organizations. It seems, nevertheless, and I could go more into detail uh, uh, in in during the questions and responses, there is nonetheless a ditch uh, between the potential of the A3 and what they and and the actual coherence of the voice of Africa and its capabilities to act within the uh, Security Council of the UN, and this is why these three African countries are members of the UN 
when the PCS does not uh, is silent and does not react to affairs of the Africa continent and union, because the main pillar of the uh, African architecture of peace and security, which is the promotion of peace, the promotion of stability and security in Africa, this EPSA benefits from the uh, support of the African Union and two other subsidiary uh, organizations, the Committee of the Chief of Staffs and the Committee of Experts. I would like to continue uh, speaking of the PSC because that is really the heart, the foundation of un the Africa Union. It has the power to authorize missions, peacekeeping missions, to impose sanctions in cases of unconstitutional changes in government, to take on initiatives of and actions that are appropriate in response to undergoing uh, conflicts or potential conflicts. So the consultative role of the PCS also recognizes the right to intervene uh, in uh, member states in the cases of genocide or war crimes or crimes against humanity. So as of 2004, the PSC has been able to uh, intervene in the crises in Darfur, Le Comores, Somalia, and the uh, RDC, DRC, Cote d'Ivoire, Burundi, and there are other countries in Africa as well. It has adopted resolutions putting in place uh, peacekeeping operations from the African Union in Somalia and Darfur and imposed sanctions against the persons and putting in and questioning who have questioned uh, put in danger or peace and security in those areas and then also uh, put in place embargoes. So the PCS is the decisional organization part for uh, handling uh, the resolution of conflicts on the continent. It is the main key uh, that is really uh, allowing a rapid and efficient answer to crises and conflicts in Africa. And it really is uh, has all the rights uh, its decisions are constraining for the member uh, states of Africa. I have said it, they're binding, their, their decisions are binding. So I, uh, I, the PSC is supported by the group of the wise, the elders that um, to undertake all necessary actions to prevent conflicts, the group of elders uh, is is committed to the peace to peace and stability in Africa and we have been able to see what this group of elders is capable of during this past crises in Ethiopia in the Tigris region and under this group of elders we were able to come to a, an accord a treaty that was signed that allowed that that uh, put this uh, terrible war to an end. Another pillar of the APSA in Africa is the uh, continental system of uh, rapid alert, the sky. Its objective is to avoid the conflicts on the continent and to provide a, a, a answers to the uh, violence on the continent and to give indicators uh, within this optic. Its uh, arena of operations allows for the prevention of conflicts as a pre uh, necessary condition to peace, security, and stability in Africa. I would also like to mention the Committee of the Chief of Staffs that was established by Article 13 Article 8 of the PSC and the Committee of the Chief of Staffs um, counsels the PCS on all military matters to maintain and consolidate and build peace in Africa. The committee, uh, the general staff also um, invites all members of the Africa Union to 
assisted to ensure the proper operation of its activities. I would like to come back to the military uh, uh, er arena of the plant of the arm of the African Union, the um, the uh, standby forces, which al allows the deployment of missions to support peace and intervention intervention to support peace. These standby forces have as a mission missions of observation, monitoring, surveillance and to uh, do all to support the peace in its member states and in certain uh, serious uh, situations to reestablish peace and security and to prevent the escalation of a conflict. Uh, prior to that, in terms of the full operationalization of the African Armed uh, Standby Forces that was declared in January 2016, the Conference of the African Union had created uh, a capacity, what we call the CARIC, uh, the response rapid a mechanism, a provisional response for an immediate response to a crisis. And uh, from the CARIC, gave the U African Union a solid, uh, a strong group to respond efficiently to urgent emergency situations that were uh, attack that were undermining peace and security. So the African Union can um, deploy these uh, rapid forces uh, to its member states. And in January 2016, the Africa Union decided to prolong the mandate of the CARIC to uh, continue the exercises, uh, training exercises, to be uh, to really maintain the operational uh, readiness of the forces. So a link in this chain in Africa that we will come back to, which is um, the the funds for peace that allows to provide financially to finance the peace missions and other activities connected to peace and security. So this is a, a quick overview of what the Africa Union has put in place to manage uh, and resolve conflicts in Africa. Um, but you may ask me, why is it that in spite of this a very impressive uh, groupment of organizations that, or that, that, that brings together uh, all these strategies, why is there still an, so many conflicts? It is true that the reality of conflicts is persistent in Africa. It, it really makes, gives a feeling of helplessness. Uh, and the, or the, the, um, organizations really feel helpless. And this helplessness is principally due to the lack of financial resources necessary to assure its, uh, proper functioning. The financing of the organization was always the weak point of the organization. So to construct a, a prosperous Africa, an integrated, unified Africa, the objective of the 2063 agenda of the Africa Union has a number of uh, common aspirations to finance its own development, to no longer be dependent on the donors, ex external donors, an, an objective that is clearly uh, marked in the agenda 2063 and to put an end to the um, uh, external financing of the Africa Union. And it is a, a really fundamental challenge. Until now, all of the plans and programs developed uh, for and from the continent have uh, encountered financial problems. These uh, financial issues are a seen absolutely necessary uh, condition for the Africa continent to put in. The contributions of the African states does not come with the quickness and the levels wished for or needed, the first thing. For a long time, the continental organization 
was really dependent on the international community. More than three quarters of the resources of the African organization come from states outside of Africa. And whatever the conditions that are created uh, in terms of the freedom of actions, in terms of sometimes the donors wish to observe to not only on the usage of their uh, funds, but also on the direction of the mechanisms put in place. So it is obvious that we have to admit, let's be truthful with each other. Uh, it is neither with the funding from outside is not without their own interest. And often uh, leads to difficulty. We have a problem currently in Somalia. It's not that the objectives have not been, uh, it's not that the uh, objectives have been uh, attained, it's that the financing has disappeared. We have to reinvent the manner to restabilize the country all while the threats have uh, been responsible for the forces uh, still there. There is another factor one cannot ignore that has a negative uh, impact on the entire continent. It's the difficulties, recurring difficulties for the uh, elaboration of these projects. And I can tell you, I can cite several examples, problems that uh, uh, are still in difficulty. So the thought is there, the reflections are there, the concepts are in place. But the means to uh, lead these ideas to manifest themselves is in question. For example, the action plan of Lagos. It's symptomatic of this uh, lack. It it adopted in 2020. It is uh, it was supposed to allow for each region to take ownership of uh, the regional security based on the base of the 1994 treaty that established an economic African community. And that also failed. There is a long list of action plans in Africa that are buried from the lack of finance um, financing. In the sub-region uh, of Africa, Central Africa, there was a program, regional economic program put in place to to respond to a small uh, amount for each country but this was this the the monies were not made available and central africa continues to not be able to finance its own peace operations it's been an impact it was a marvelous idea on paper everybody believed in it <clears throat> we thought Africa would be able to fix all its problems, its lack of financing, <clears throat> but it stayed a, a lethargic uh, initiative. We need greater political will so that st contributing states honor their financial commitments. Otherwise, the thousands of resolutions that are adopted are not assured to be put in place, to be implemented. And this is an unfortunate um, evaluation means that uh, it has a role in all the financing of all the mechanisms in Africa. The fun fundamental question is how do we set up an independent strategy with regard to international aid? In June 2016, the African Union decided that an institutional reform of the Union was necessary. This reform was entrusted to the Rwandan President Paul Kagame. In 2017, the member states of the African Union only financed 14% of their own budgets. Between 2016 and 2017, the AU's budget was 700 billion euros, and a large portion of this amount was the responsibility of external partners. This poses questions about the efficiency of the AU's actions, because we cannot forget that the hand that feeds you is always 
above the hand that receives to give uh, financial means to the African Union is a way of internalizing its power to give it more autonomy. This is why it was proposed that a 0.2% tax be set up on the importation of non-African products on the continent and the strengthening of sanctions for country that, countries that do not pay their dues. This import tax uh, should finance 970 million euros for um, several programs and element and fuel the peace fund. Now, the program for peacekeeping will continue to be financed by external aid. So this tax, uh, which was initiated and proposed by a former minister of Rwanda, Kaberuka, this tax should make it possible to have the resources necessary to finance the um, expenses of intervention operations in the field, such as peace and security missions. If the proposal of a tax to self-finance uh, these operations is attractive, it has not yet been established and has led to some controversies. Certain countries have expressed reservations and fears regarding this particular tax. So the implementation of this tax may be compromised um, if a more collaborative approach is not adopted to implementing this tax. Dear friends, more than half a century after its creation, this continental organization still does not have the means to finance itself. This year, in 2023, the budget stipulates 31.5% uh, to of the budget to be obtained from member states. And 66% will come from external partners. The strong budgetary dependence on its external partners is difficult to sustain. It's very difficult to sustain this level of dependency. This organization needs adequate resources that are reliable, um, that are predictable to assure sustainable um, management of continental affairs. The share of African uh, contributions does not go over 7%. And according to uh, provisions, the tax to be financed that has been planned could finance up to 100% of operational budgets for the African Union. The, this tax, the Kaberuka tax, was proposed by uh, Mr. Kaberuka, who's the high representative in charge of peace for the African Union. And this was this effort was continued by the president of Rwanda. So the president of the African Commission recently declared that to sum up the difficulties of Africa, we only have two choices left. Go forth resolutely in the implementation of a reform or l allow failure to succeed. I would like to say one word on a particular pillar uh, that I was asked to talk about, the uh, silencing the guns uh, program. The 2063 agenda has established common aspirations um, which this project is one of, this silence the arms, and to ensure a peaceful Africa. Now, prior to this, this program was supposed to be achieved by 2020. Now we're talking about 2030. So that means that by 2030, Africa must end all wars, all conflicts that are undermining the continent. Given the current situation, on the continent, we can say that this is actually an audacious estimate. 2030 is not far away. It's merely barely seven years away. But the reality that we see on the continent today is far from corroborating this ambition. We have multiple crises on the continent, and they are far from being resolved. The situation in Sudan, in DRC, in Libya, are far from having um, definitive settlements that achieve peace. By 2030, numerous African countries will have elections, 
And we know that electoral periods are very sensitive in Africa because they are often a source of conflicts. And let's not forget geopolitical rivalries between great powers, which means that Africa is in a true pressure cooker. And this means that the African continent is often an area where they uh, confront each other. And now, the terrorist attacks in the Sahel region uh, up to the Gulf of Guinea, this shows the vulnerability of this region. The situation in Mali remains precarious. Uh, the Lake Chad Basin, armed forces from the various countries of the sub-region are at war against the insurrection led by Boko Haram. In the east of the DRC, insecurity is chronic. And this means that the entire Great Lakes region is on alert, as well as all of Central Africa. And all of this is exacerbated because of the December 2023 elections that will take place in DRC. Um, the pr situation in Sudan is worrisome with the flow of refugees that are moving towards the borders, the small arms and small caliber weapons that are circulating. Um, the UN estimates there are over, over 2.7 million arms that are circulating in Sudan outside of state uh, supplies. We also have, you know, we must also note that Africa still has the sad record, the unfortunate record of the number of peacekeeping operations. Out of 16 peacekeeping operations in the world, nine are in Africa. And we hope that even with the uh, big change that we saw last week in Mali, there still remains nine. Now, there are still many challenges to the continent, uh, the climate risk, uh, the rise of terrorism, the lack of governance, the problem with natural resources and geopolitical um, clashes and rival race. We have to be very optimistic and have a lot of faith to believe that the wars that face the continent are going to end within seven years. We can say that this ambition of having an Africa without conflicts by 2030 seems very cosmetic, uh, whereas the reality is much harder. Now, it is not just a slogan. It's really a vision. And I am one of those <clears throat> we think that when a people does not have a vision, it is headed for perdition. perdition. So we must yes. believe in this goal for the peace and security of Africans by 2030. This is a vision that must be nourished. A peaceful Africa by 2030 could happen. I come from a country, Gabon, that has never had a war that has never known war, be it war with another state or an internal war. So I think that what happened in Gabon, what exists in Gabon, can happen in all of Africa, I think, and I am convinced that there is a real optimistic outlook for Africa to be a haven for peace by 2030. And I will conclude by saying we could ask our questions. If Afri the African Union through APSA, can it ensure and maintain peace on the continent? Or, and can it prevent and settle conflicts in Africa? The answer is shown throughout you know, the multiple conflicts that we see throughout the continent that bear witness to the fragility of this geographic space uh, in, in a violent world. Africa, like other areas like the Middle East, um, are spaces for the experimentation of new theories in resolving armed conflicts. Now, Africa taking responsibility for its own conflicts and for working on preventing new conflicts is fundamental. It is obvious that to stop and regulate these processes uh, that lead to conflicts, we must limit and act on the deep factors that lead to conflicts. The roots of wars, the roots of conflicts in Africa would only 
be avoided if there is a broader approach that includes socioeconomic security with an improvement in the living conditions of the populations of the continent. What does what is peace? What is security if the factors of insecurity and disorder are not stopped and blocked? Now, outside of all of this, and this is a very important question, it remains that the responsibility for peace and international security is mainly the responsibility of the UN, UN Security Council. This is in the UN Charter. The Security Council the peoples of the world have given the council the responsibility to act for peace and also to finance peace. Africa, uh, whose people belong to the world, the world population and having signed the charter must validly aspire to security and dignity, just like any other people. And this means that there must be an equitable, um, action by the UN towards taking care of the conflicts in Africa. Now, the main, the A3 is the principal um, actor on this. We are, our aspiration is to have peace operations in Africa financed through the UN's budget. It's not, it's really a question of law and ethics. And we truly hope that this vital advocacy effort will be listened to and will receive the response it deserves because of its relevance and because all the peoples of the world aspire to collective security. Thank you.